Hi guys, um, it's me again. I hope you guys had a wonderful weekend this weekend. Um, if you're like me, you just did the same thing you do every day since we've been in this quarantine, right? Oh well, and this is what you get. No makeup, no fuss, but I'm really excited to be reading Ida B with you again. We're gonna be reading chapters 19 and 20. And I hope sometime that you will drop me a message in Class Dojo. I would love to hear from all of you. I miss you so much. Um, hope you're enjoying Ida B. And we're going to get started. Um, you know, she's kind of going through a lot of feelings here. And I'm really curious to see how her character develops throughout all of this. And see if you, I mean, while you may not be dealing with someone having cancer, but, you know, this is a, a really tough time that we're going through. It's something, you guys are part of history. You know, this is a major point in history, and one day you're going to look back and say, wow, I was a part of that. I lived through that. So, this is a really big deal. Okay, chapter 19. Ronnie DeCulper was small and blonde and ran faster than anybody in our grade. He was almost always smiling, and if I was going to like somebody, I suppose it would have been him. He was real friendly, even when people were kind of rude, and he never picked on other kids. But he was bad in math. Can some of you relate? I can. Not in adding or subtracting, but in multiplying. Ding, 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 ding. Is that ring a bell with some of you? He pretty well stunk so much that every time he raised his hand or got caught on, I just closed my eyes and waited it out because I knew it wasn't going to be right. Sometimes I'd think, man, Ronnie, you need to hang it up. But he kept on trying. That's a point. You never give up. You keep trying. And I respected him for not giving up, even though it looked like a losing battle to me. So I was supposed to sit with him during study time and show him how I learned the times tables, but I couldn't remember how I learned them except that Mama and Daddy just kept saying them to me and asking me questions or making me recite them. And I kept trying and pretty soon I knew all of them. That's what you guys can do, you just have to practice. I could tell Ronnie was embarrassed that I was going to be teaching him because the first time I came over to his desk, he just looked down at his feet. Now, I know it's hard not to do well at something, and I know it's hard to need help. So instead of not saying anything or waiting for him to say something, which would be my cold heart routine, I ended up saying hi because I felt awful seeing friendly, happy Ronnie, the fastest runner, looking so uncomfortable and feeling so bad about himself. Hi, Ronnie, I said, I, I'm sorry, I said as I sat down at the desk next to his, which was the only time I'd said hello to another kid since I started coming here three weeks, three, I'm sorry, started coming there weeks ago. I believe Ronnie was unaware of the greatness of my effort, though, because he just mumbled, hey, back, and was still watching his shoe, like seeing it scrape along the floor was the most interesting thing ever. Well, if this had been big-headed Calvin Fairbolt, who thinks he's too fine for his own reflection, I would say he was being beyond rude. But this was Ronnie, and he was just a good guy feeling down. My rock-hard heart swelled up a little bit, even though I didn't want it to. I talked to Ronnie real quietly so nobody could hear us, and he wouldn't get any more embarrassed. Want to play a game? I asked. Want to play a game, Ronnie? He looked at me just halfway to see if I was serious or teasing him or just plain crazy. What kind of game, he asked. A brain game, I said. It's like an obstacle course for your brain. I'm not too good at brain stuff, he mumbled and went back to being fascinated with his shoe. Yes, you are. You just don't know it, I told him. Ronnie, do you run a lot? I run all the time. I bet if I ran all the time, I could be as fast as you, I said. I doubt it, he said back, which got me a little peeved, but at least he was looking straight at me now, and all of his shame was gone. He was getting ready to go. Anyway, I said, 
because I decided to let that last bit lie. It's all about practice. We're going to have to practice for this game and then we're going to play and I'm going to beat the pants off of you forever unless you keep practicing. If you practice, you might beat me sometimes. Do you want to play or not? Now I knew that we were at the point where either Ronnie gets insulted, spits on my shoe and says, forget it, or he gets fired up and says, let's go. And I could see both ideas were going through his head at the same time because he was looking at my shoe and moving his mouth around like he was putting together a big goober. But he also was scraping his shoe real fast across the floor like he was getting ready to hop to it. Okay, he finally said, what are we playing for? I don't know, I answered. We could play for who gets to go first next time. Nah, that's baby stuff. Let's play for quarters. Well, I liked that plan for two reasons. I liked that Ronnie was a competitor, competitor because that meant he was going to try and this whole thing wasn't going to be as boring or pitiful as I thought. And I also liked it because I knew I was going to make some money. All right, I said, and I decided in my head that almost every time we played the game, I'd challenge Ronnie to a running race at the end of the day so he could win his money back. Or some of it, anyway. But our races would have to be in private so nobody would think, would think I was having fun. Then I showed Ronnie what he had to do to practice. We started with the easiest multiplication, multiplication you can do, other than the ones times anything, the tens times tables. First, I showed him how every answer is just the number you're multiplying by 10 with a, with a zero after it. Ah, you're getting a math lesson, you guys know that. Then I made him write out the tens times tables a bunch of times, and I did it with him so he didn't feel lonely. We had to say the tens times table over and over backward too. Then we quizzed each other with just the basics. That's some tips for you boys and girls that don't know your multiplication very well. You need to go ahead and practice while you have this time to do so and learn those times tables. What's two times 10, Ronnie? 20. What's eight times 10, Ida? Like that till we were all warmed up. After two days of that, we were ready for the Celebrity Challenge. For Celebrity Challenge, you can be anybody from any time, even from stories if you want. Ronnie wanted to be Carl Lewis, the all-around track star, and I was Queen Elizabeth the first because she had red hair and she was Queen of England without a king or a prince or anything. For this particular game, the first person to get to 25 right, to get 25 right wins, in the first round, you ask each other just the basic times tables questions, but you can switch stuff around a little. You can ask, what is 12 times 10? But you can also ask, what is 10 times 12? In the second round, you can add or subtract a multiple too, like what is 10 times 10 minus two times 10? If you need a sudden death tiebreaker, you can be very complicated, but you have to be fair. You're not supposed to use paper, but I let Ronnie use it for the first couple of times, and I did beat the pants off him too a lot. But over time, I could tell he was practicing at home because he was getting better and trickier. Sometimes he'd want to play even when we weren't in study time, like when we were lining up to go outside and he thought he'd come up with a particular, particularly sly question. Hey, Ida, he'd say, a quarter for one question. Just one question for a whole quarter, come on. But most times I wouldn't even talk back to him because I didn't want other kids thinking I was hanging around with anybody. The only way Ronnie could beat me was if he went first and every once in a great while he did it. But I never beat him at running even though I got closer so it was fair. I'd race him at the end of the day while everybody was waiting for their buses if nobody was paying attention. We'd sneak out behind the school and run from the first yellow line on the playground to the back fence. Then I'd give him a quarter and we'd walk back, back to our bus lines acting like we didn't know each other at all. And I almost had fun with Ronnie, but I'd never tell myself he was my friend because I met him at Ernest B. Lawson Elementary School. Chapter 20. One day after lunch, Mrs. W. told the class, I know it's time to read, but I don't think I can do it today. My voice is too tired. 
She put her hand on her throat and scrunched her face up like something was painting her. It was the same face she'd made when Simone Martini was just about yelling across the room to Patrice Polinski and Ms. W would say, Simone, use your, but you know what she's gonna say, use your inside voice. You're hurting my ears. Everybody looked up from their chattering or worksheets at just about the same time in exactly the same direction with the same expression on their faces. A mix of 30% shock, 20% disbelief, and 50% plain old sad. Because they love to hear her read. Oh man, Matthew Dribble said right out loud. I felt like the bottom had just dropped out of my stomach and everything I ate for lunch was tumbling around in my gut. Nope, my voice is just too tired, Miss W said, and sure enough, it was sounding weak and raspy. And we were going to read Alexandra Potemkin and the Space Shuttle to Planet Z. Well, that's disappointing. Miss W sat down, put her head in her hand, and her body wilted. Like not, like not only was her voice tired, but every bone in her body needed a rest. Please, begged Alice May Grunderman. Please, Ms. Washington, asked Patrice and Simone at the same time with the same moon-eyed face. And then everybody got the idea and it became sort of a song with a verse of, please, Ms. Washington, and a chorus of, please, please, please. But Ms. W's voice was deteriorating at an alarming speed because now she could only speak in a hoarse whisper and everybody had to stop with their pleasing just to hear her. I'm sorry, but I can't. She paused and we couldn't all tell by the look, I'm sorry, she paused and we could all tell by the look on her face that she was thinking hard. So we stayed quiet to give her some room. Maybe, she said, looking up and forcing a weak smile, we could have a guest reader just for today. Well, it was hard to imagine anybody but Ms. W reading and we all just sat there for a minute. I love that they are enjoying reading, much like you guys. I just love that Miss Drowdy and I get so excited when you guys, when we see the excitement for reading that was building right before we left school. And I hope you're not losing that excitement, boys and girls. I, I just can't explain to you how happy it makes Ms. Drotty and I to know that you have that passion. You're getting that passion for reading. And I hope you're enjoying our read-alongs because I am really enjoying reading to you guys. Now, I'm not so good at this YouTube stuff and I'm trying to get it figured out on recording it, but here we go back to the story. Then one by one, people started nodding their heads and looking at each other and nodding more and smiling because nobody wanted to miss the story, Tom, not even Tina Politi, who usually slept through it. And after a couple of minutes of that, people started looking at Ms. W, nodding their heads real hard, sticking out their chests and saying out loud, I think that's a great idea. And yes, let's have a guest reader today because they were realizing that maybe they could be the guest reader and star student of the afternoon. They wanted to remind Ms. Washington that not only were they superb readers, but wonderful human beings too. Especially Calvin Big Headed Fairball, who actually raised his hand and I just knew it was to volunteer out of the kindness of his big, fat, big headed heart. But Ms. W didn't even look in Calvin's direction. Ida, since I know you've read the book, she said to me weakly, like it, like it was her last request. Could you please read the first chapter today? Well, I was so shocked and embarrassed, sitting there with my mouth wide open that I could almost couldn't tell that the other kids were staring at me with their mouths wide open too. Making words into story music like Miss W did was the one thing I wanted to do more than just about anything in the world. But telling a story out loud in front of my class at Ernest B. Lawson Elementary School was nearly the last thing I'd wanted to do in my entire life. I was so confused about whether I should be happy or scared, I just sat there. 
Ms. W got up, walked over to me, put her face next to my stunned and frozen one and whispered, Ida, I need your help. And there I was, hypnotized by that woman again. I was like a dog that would go fetch Mrs. W, Ms. W's stick, even if it was in a snake hole under a thorn bush that had just been sprayed by a skunk. I looked at Ms. W, just scared now because I knew I was going to do it, but I didn't know how. I know you'll be great, she croaked, and in my head, I was already trotting off looking for that stick, even though I could smell the stink and the thorns were pricking me. I don't know if you understand what she's saying there, but she, her hard-hearted heart, she really loves Miss W. And she's saying that she would do anything for her. She she feels like a dog that if you've ever played fetch with a dog and you throw them the stick and they'll just go anywhere to get that stick and bring it back to you. She knows that she's going to do this because, you know, Miss Mrs. W, you know, kind of softened her hard-hearted heart a little bit. She's starting to feel again. So she's saying that she's going to read. Do you want to sit there or in my chair? Ms. W asked. I'll sit here, I mumbled. She set the book down on my desk, brought her chair over, sat down next to me, put her head back, and closed her eyes. Whenever you're ready, Ida, she rasped. Ms. W had given me quite a few books to read already because it only took me one or two days at the most to read them unless I was working on my Terrify the People Who Bought Our Land project. Alexandra Potemkin and the Space Shuttle to Planet Z was my favorite so far. It was Rufus's favorite too, I think, because he was turning out about a quart of spit every chapter of the book I read. I got tingly in my fingers thinking about opening up the book and reading those words out loud, making my voice go high and low, rough and smooth, like I did in my room. Like I've always said to you guys, when you are reading silently in your head, you need to make those characters have a voice. If it's a raspy voice, you read it in your imagination in a raspy voice. You've got to make your characters come alive. And this is what Ida B does. But my legs were shivering like they were out in a blizzard, and my stomach was flipping forward, then backward, forward, then backward, thinking about all of those people looking at me and hearing my voice. Some of you can relate to that, right? When you have to stand up and read out loud or answer a problem out loud, um, it can be kind of scary. And it was a little bit scary for me to, to go into this venture of recording myself on YouTube and... It, it's, uh, we can all relate to that scary kind of nervous feeling. I closed my eyes, put my right hand on top of the book, and passed it lightly across the cover. It was cool and smooth, like the stone from the bottom of the brook, and it stilled me. A whole other world is inside there, I thought to myself, and that's where I want to be. I opened the book and got ready to read the title, but I could feel everybody's eyes on me. Crowding me so there was hardly any air, the only sounds that came out of me were little peeps like a baby bird chirping. Alexandra, Potemkin, and the space shuttle to planet Z. Ms. Washington, with her eyes still closed, leaned over and whispered, You'll have to read louder, honey, so everyone can hear. Yes, ma'am, I whispered back. I took a deep breath, filled my stomach up with air, and then made my muscles squeeze it out so it pushed a big gust of wind over my voice box and out of my mouth. Chapter one, I bellowed. My voice was so loud it surprised me and I jumped back a little in my chair, but nobody laughed. They were listening. The book is about Alexandra and her parents think she's quite difficult, but actually she is a genius who is assisting the also genius scientist Pr Professor Zelensky in her quest to explore the lost planet Z. Alexandra gets into some trouble, but really she is just a very focused person. Sounds like I'd be, right? Maybe that's why she likes it. At first, I was worrying about all of those people watching and listening, but after a few minutes, I left that classroom and went into the story. 
I was in Alexandra's laboratory instead of at school, and I was just saying out loud everything I saw her do or felt her feel. I let my voice tell the way she did it and saw it and felt it. And I was so looking forward to seeing what happened next, I forgot that I was reading. All of a sudden, it was the end of the chapter, and it was like I was snatched out of a dream and couldn't quite recall where I was. I looked around and saw I was sitting at a desk. There was a book in front of me. Kids were staring at me, and slowly I remembered. I glanced over at Ms. W, and she smiled and whispered, Thank you very much, Ida. That was lovely. I handed Ms. W the book and we got back to work and everything was just like always, except that Ms. W had to write all the instructions on the board instead of talking them. At study time, when I went to Ronnie's desk, he looked right in my eyes and said, you read real good, Ida. And this time it was me staring down at my shoes like they might disappear if I didn't keep watching them. My throat got stopped up so I could hardly say thank you. Nothing was different except the warm glow that was in my belly and my arms and my legs and my head wouldn't go away, even on the long, cruddy bus ride home. Wow, Ida has just um, experienced her passion. Uh, so I want you to think about, I'll come back tomorrow and read two chapters with you tomorrow. So I want you to think about Ida B and her experience with reading out loud to the class. Um, I really want you guys to think about practice when you're reading silently in your head. I know that you guys are imagining those characters and how they sound. And I just want you know you to keep reading and enjoy that passage. And until I see you tomorrow, I love you guys very much. Please send me a message on Class Dojo. Send me pictures of you reading anything. I love, love, love seeing you guys, and I love you so much. I miss you so much. Have a wonderful day, guys.